Welcome to The Point of View. It's your uh, Monday night and Wednesday night show on CTTV, bringing you the right guests, asking the relevant questions on issues that matter to you. Well, this week we're celebrating Founders Day for the first time in Ghana's history. August 4 is a holiday, and a lot of people are wondering why. Well, I have a special show for you today. I have two intellectuals who will be discussing two books they've written to try and put every part of our history into great context. It's a really exciting show. If you're watching and you want to contribute, there's a WhatsApp number on the screen. Get in touch. Our hashtag is Point of View, and we're also live on Facebook at CTV. When we come back, I'll tell you who my guests are. So August 4 has been christened Founders Day by this government, and it set a lot of tongues wagging. The CPP say this holiday is just to commemorate the failed political leaders of the UGCC tradition. The NDC say if they win power, they are going to scrap the holiday because it's not part of Ghana's history. In fact, they accuse the Akufado government of writing our history. So if you're watching this on Founders Day, it's a good time to think. And I have two great men to talk to about parts of our history, Pan-Africanism, the year of return, and everything else. The first one is Professor H.B. Martinson, a man who's authored two, 20 books. He's a, quite the intellectual and has a very interesting life story himself. His latest book is titled The Return of Descendants of the Diasporan Africans to Continental Africa, including Ghana. He coined the term Afro-mundialism. We'll be speaking to him about some of the concepts in the book, the significance of Founders Day, significance of Year of Return, Ghana's role in Pan-Africanism, what we can do to leverage the way we are seeing. We're the first country in Africa Obama visited when he was, uh, he became president. Incidentally, Obama was born on August the 4th, the same day we commemorate as uh, Founders Day. So we'll be, we'll be talking to him about that. And later on during the show, I'll interview the author of another good, a very exciting book on Dr. Kofi Abrefabuzia. Really great work. Anania J is my guest for the next part of the show. So you're going to have a double decker on a holiday. So relax and enjoy. Let me start with my in-studio guest, Professor Matheson. Great to have you. Thank you, Bernard. It's my pleasure. It's amazing. I never get tired talking to you. You have a very interesting story. You, you went to school with Ali Mahama. You were in the same year group with him in Tamasco. Then you did your studies in the University of Ghana. You went to Russia. You went to Senegal. You went to France. And this is quite an interesting trajectory. Just talk to me briefly about such a background. Ghana, Dakar, Moscow, Sorbonne. This is interesting. How did you end up in all these places? Good. Well, just to chip in. First of all, thanks so much for this remembrance. But I will surprise you to realize that I did not start my education as an art scholar. Okay. In the secondary school, I did physics, math, math. And I was the youngest to have taken to military academy to do medicine in Russia. Before you ask who were my colleagues and who were my... General Nidaho, Kukua Nidaho's father was my mate. General Bing, my mate. Mr. Bidema retired, my mate. General Yaya Mama, my mate. And there was the seventh intake. Of the Ghana Armed Forces. Of the Ghana Armed Forces. But you studied in Russia. Of the Ghana Armed Forces, who were sent to Russia to do medicine. So we stayed in Russia for three years after the sixth school. Cool, they brought us back. If you were by that time of age, you would hear one Russian doctor pass Kulebu exams. And I was the one they were referring to. So Legon took me back. And Legon said, Well, there are two things. We will not like to taint our medicine with Russian medicine. So either you change your course or not. I said, no problem. I did French in school. I did history in school. Why don't I change on? So I switch on. So you were trained as a doctor? I did my second MD. So if you ask me, what's my first degree? BSc Medical Sciences. Trained in Russia? Russia. And then because the Ghanaian University wouldn't accept you? That's right. You became a social scientist? A social scientist. So from there, I continued to Dakar. That is... I made the world so I say I made the Sheikh Anta Job University. And incidentally, Sheikh Anta Job, Dr. Sheikh Anta Job, was the one in charge of African civilization and Pan Africanism. At the time. At the time. Which so year is this? 
There was 73, 75 I was there. I was there in Dhaka when the former vice chancellor of Kekosh University and then formerly what is called Minister of Education, they came there for this one year abroad in Cape Coast. I mean, in, Senegal. in French. So they met me there. And it was there that I met a lot of... So you interacted people. with Job personally? Job was my lecturer as we wow. sat down. You together. are privileged. How is Senegal in the francophone establishment in Africa? It's a lot of... When I travel around the world, I see a lot of these people work at World Bank, IMF, ADB from Senegal. Senegal is the most advanced francophone African country. In what sense? In the sense that their institutions are well established. Quote and unquote, there is that symbi symbiosis between them and other African countries. So they're enlightened. Very, very friendly. It's very intellectual. Very intellectualized. But Ivory Coast had more money. So Ivory Coast seemed to be like the economic Cote base. Côte it was because of the personality of, you know, the late Félix Sofo mm. And as I said some time ago, I had been opportunity to have been one of the 32 biographers of Sofo before he died. There were two Africans, Professor Kolo Touré and then Professor H.B. Matheson. So you were one of his biographers? Biographers. Félix Sofé Boigny. Félix Sofé Boigny. And the title of the book was Félix Sofé Boigny and African Peace. Was he a successful leader? Because when he left, the country plunged into this instability. Good. That's a very good question. It is always interesting to, you know, realize that where the Francophones are precisely mother France, France would not like to give chance to Africans. So once they found Ofo as a good, you know, clientele, a good customer, they actually, you know, utilize him. For instance, as I said, 23rd July 1990, I was privileged to have sat down before Ofo, And I asked Ofo, Ofo, what was your problem with Nkrumah? Permit me, let me disturb your audience. Mon cher président, je voudrais savoir qu'est-ce qu'il est le problème entre vous et notre ancien président Kwame Nkrumah. He laughed. He said there was nothing. It was only colonialism. C'est de rien. Sauf le colonialisme, c'est pour cela que je, je regarde Nkrumah comme un ennemi. That is what I'm saying that there was nothing. It was only colonialism that made me to look at Nkrumah as my enemy. Because Nkrumah was... N Nkrumah against new was colonialism. progressive and, and a new colonialism. And Hufe Boigny was almost like an agent of new colonialism. Precisely. And if you look, let me, what is it called, intellectually, you know, some sort. Here, before the establishment of the OAU, if you can recollect, Secretary had problem with France. Secretary went to General de Gaulle. Let me paraphrase That's you. Guinea. Guinea. So today we went to, you know, Jean Radigo, Antoine Jean Radigo. Mon cher le général, écoutez-moi, pour moi et mes peuples guinéens, nous préférons notre indépendance maintenant, plus que l'esclavage. Viens que vient, advient que pourra, donnez-moi. We want independence now. Good. We want our independence now. Me and my co colleagues Guinea. Me and my colleagues, give it to us now. So, Jean Radigo looked at him and said, ah bon? I'm pity African, le voila. You a small African leader, get your independence. And you was on the basis of this, Nkrumah formed the Ghana Guinea Mali Union. Because Guinea was too small to be a viable state without French support. Precisely. And Nkrumah had to support them. Precisely. So, in, in retrospect, was, has, if you compare Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire now, incidentally, this government is having discussions with Cote d'Ivoire to promote the cocoa industry. They want to have the same price. If you look at the two countries after Hufe Banyan and Krumen's departure, which of them was right in terms of the advancement of their people? Because Cote d'Ivoire plunged into war. We, we haven't been to war, but Cote d'Ivoire seems to have um, some sort of economic and advantage. That is, that is precisely to state ipso facto that Nkrumah was a visionary. Not to waste about that. Why a visionary? Nkrumah had the interests of his people, looked at Africa as a greater partner, either than dancing the political plan logo of the Western world. Mm. And that is why Ufubani, that is his mistake. So w w would you say Bagbo's overthrow 
was part of this narrative. Precisely, and it was unfortunate. It was unfortunate. It should be the worry of all academia and the media, not the politicians. Babu should not have been overthrown. Do you know him personally? I know Babu personally. Babu would knock at your room, room 17. He was in room 22 and say, Ghana. Room 17 of where? That is Sorbonne in the Kula. University of Sorbonne, yeah, France. University of Sorbonne. Yes. What did you study in Sorbonne? I studied French. And Babo was a historian. And Pan Africanism. And he was. So, so Babo was. He was in history and Pan Africanism. So, he was, was he trying to indigenize the Ivorian economy for which reason? Because some people believe France had a hand in his. In that his is very good. Babo wanted to Africanize their, their what is it called, economy. But as it is with the protocol for independence, before a president will ask for external you know, aid or external business, consult France first. But Babu consulted Chinese. And that was to the chagrin of, you know, the French. They said, ah, you have come now, we'll show you. So it's interesting for somebody who studied in France, who speaks excellent French. You don't think the French are up to any good in Africa, do you? France, or the French, permit me to say, they have nothing good in Africa. Neither the British or what. Africa, it is for Africa. We are not saying this. That is what I say, Afro-mondialism. And then we'll come to that. You coined the term Afro-mondialism. Yeah. So let, let's talk about today. It's a holiday, and it's called Founders Day. A lot of people don't understand why. A couple of things that happened. The government says that 21st September, which is Founders Day as per what the NDC put in place, should be Nkrumah Day, Nkrumah Memorial Day, because Nkrumah is not the only founder of Ghana. And that actually, the nation was founded on the basis of what the UGCC put in place on August 4, 1947. You are a historian. Do you, do you, do you buy that? To an extent. Now, within the limits of historical analysis, before we come to this, let's trace the genesis, mm. the pathogenesis, and the revelations of our independence. UGCC, as you and I, Bernard, know, it stands for United Gold Coast Convention. Mm. Who is the father of these babies? I'm sure it's Pa Grant, isn't it? Precisely, Bernard. It is unimaginable for us in the media and academia, leave the politicians aside, to jump to a hasty conclusion that is so so and so is. Yes, J.B. Dankwa, Dr. J.B. Dankwa, is symbiotically related, quote and unquote, to UGC. Why? As I said, history has it that. It was Pa Grant, and was known as George Alfred Grant, who arrived back from Europe. Mm. And then J.P. Dankwa was a vibrant economist, a vibrant historian, a vibrant, you know, media man. So he beckoned him. Who beckoned him? That is what is it called, Pa Grant. J.B. I have come, I'm quoting verbatim, I'm quoting mm -hmm. background verbatim. Mm -hmm. I have come from Europe. I've licensed a shipping boat known as SS Asini. I've got enough money. Let's traditionalize our politics. In other words, we need a local political movement. So he invited him to the UGC. He invited him. <clears throat> to, to form the party. First, he called him. Yeah, but I, I get all that. But just asking, yeah. does that, why is August 4 a holiday? Yeah. You are getting there. Well, I, I, I'll, I'll get there. Okay. Just allow me. Mm -hmm. So J.B. Dankwa first wrote to Dr. V.C. Nakabush, OBE, Order of British, and then copied the letter to 21 other prominent people. If you read one of my books, that is the UP slash MPP in national politics, the Akufado Factor, 2017 I wrote, page 112. I have got all the 21, you know, prominent members, including... Edward Akufado, that is our president's father, including Joe Myers, Obeche Bilamte, and so many of them. So they met at Roger Club in Accra here. And that was precisely on 19th July, 1947, at 5 p.m. 
as the spirit of the letter written by J.B. Dakwa, signed by J.B. Dakwa himself. And it was, the letter was fired on the 17th of July. They met, and the day was, so here UGCC is the basis of our political movement. It's the basis of our independence. So that was the first political movement in the country. That was the first political <coughs> movement. But what happened on August 4 then? Was that the day it was officially founded? That was o o 4th August 1947. But mm -hmm. before then, don't forget, we should not forget that. Mm -hmm. We have got other political movements. There's a National Liberation Movement, Obafo Se Akoto. We have got the GCP, Ghana Congress Party, of Dr. J.P. Dankwa. And Dr. J.P. Dankwa established this party in 1952 with Sakishek as a secretary general, with Ni Ama Olenu as his deputy chairman, and then A.A. Chambers, Alfred Alassane Chamber, from the north, representing him in the north. But, but it's founders day, the day a political party was founded, or the day the nation was founded. Because people say Nkrumah, in fact, in your book, you, 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 you refer to Nkrumah, as the founder, in a way, if I'm not mistaken, Precisely. because he is the, the the one who led the liberation struggle for the British to give us independence. Let's okay. ask. So I'm just asking, how do you explain to primary school kids that August 4 is is it because? And are we saying that it is that because it's the first political party? Was our, we, were we founded just by political agitation? No. Were in there? Even it was not UGCC who founded, it, who got the independence for us. So, my point is, so why is it Founders' Day then? Well, Founders' Day in the sense that that was the day or the period we were politically, you know, awakened. Is it? Yeah. For all about Ab Aborigines' Rights Protection Society. Oh, let's come. Where, to... Weren't they there before? Aborigines, okay. Let me, that is why I wanted to go through the genealogical tree of our independence struggle. Okay. Looking at the genealogical tree. After the born of 1844, as you have rightly said, it was not a fancy confederation of getting the fourth of Mankesi. Mm. 1868-1872. Then came the Aborigines Rights Protection Society. Of fourth, I guess, 1897. Mm. Then came 1920, the West African Movement, Hayford. 1930, we should not forget. J.B. Dankwa established a vibrant youth movement, who was more or less like a political party, the Gold Coast Youth Movement, 1930. And 1947, there the birth, there the zygote of UGCC through this letter. And then Nkrumah also formed the CYO Committee of Youth Organization, 15th May 1949, Takwa. And his CPP 12 June 1949 at some point. Then we should not forget NPP, that is the Northern People's Party of Mumuni Baumia, Mumuni Dumbe, Mumuni Kore, SD Dumbo, was established 11th April 1954. There, JB Dankwa moved to the north through Sakishek, his general secretary, because 51, 54, 56 general elections. He moved to SD Dumbo and Mumuni Bahumia. Let's come into a political symbiosis so that come 1956, we'll beat Nkrumah and CPP. And there, Nkrumah and CPP were cautious. Now, people who will get up to say, whether the media or academia, that so so and so contested, JB Danko contested UGC election on the basis of UGC, I say, nah, no. J.B. Dankwa, let's look at the daily graphic of 4th August 1952, page 3, J.B. Dankwa at Zim, at Zim. J.B. Dankwa insinuates that Nkrumah fears him and his new political party, Ghana Congress Party. He didn't say, J.B. Dankwa did not say UGCC. Again, we have it that January 3rd, 1953, Emmanuel Odakwe Obechebe Lamte insinuates that Nkrumah will fail come the 1954 elections. That is 17 July 1954 mm, elections. Mm, mm. So you could see that J.B. Dankwa had already, you know, quote and unquote, abandoned 
the National Liberation Movement of Bafo say Akoto. Mm -hmm. He has abandoned the UGCC and, and established his own party, the Ghana Congress Party, which you in the media and academia are not talking about. So, uh, but still, I'm still, so I'm asking, is August for a legitimate Founders Day? It's a legitimate Founders Day because that was the day at least we started our political okay. safari. But in, in this new law that made August for a holiday, they also said that 1st July is no longer... Republic Day. That because, is unfortunate. Because that was our when we became a republic. That is unfortunate. So you disagree <coughs> with that one? <coughs> Excuse me. I disagree. First July Republic Day, when we had independence, the Queen was still the head of the Gokus or Ghana for that matter. But Republic Day Nkrumah came into the executive chair and we became colonially you know free. So for us to Excuse me for a stronger word. To bastardize first July, it is unfortunate. So you you, you agree with August four, but disagree with July one. I agree with August fourth. <coughs> Excuse me. We'll give you some. I agree with July one, but I disagree with the first July. What about twenty first twenty first September then? Because the the previous government, I think under Mills, uh, said that that was Founders Day because that was Nkrumah's birthday, like the way the Americans have Lincoln Memorial and all those things. But they made it Founders Day. With the apostrophe before the S. I leave it to the politicians. And the, this new government says it's after the S. This question, I leave it to the politicians, Bennett. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, <coughs> we're, we're talk, so, so let's let's just let's just sort of try and wrap this up. Mm -hmm. The this is going to keep changing because the opposition say when they come to office they will change all of this. Mm -hmm. How do we put a stop to these frequent changes? Good. This is the time. Academia, the media, we should be contacted to write books. Take, for instance, African Americans, I'm sure, Bernard, they come to you. Mm. They will tell you that Ghana is the pan African Jerusalem. Ghana is the pan African America. Why do they say so? Nkrumah's grave is here, Du Bois' grave is here, Joy Palmer's grave is here. But tell me, where do we have a general introduction to pan Africanism for the schools? We get up, the national, I mean, the Ghana parliament. Someone says that he's a West African ECOWAS, you know, candidate. He's a parliamentarian in West African. He's a parliamentarian in Johannes, Cape Town, Johannesburg. But as that person is he, quote and unquote, initiated into Pan Africanism, what is the definition of Pan Africanism for him? Has Pan Africanism metamorphosed? From the day that word was coined by no other person than Harry Sylvester Williams. If you ask them, you say you do wise. Do wise do not coin any pan Afghanism. It was Henry Sylvester Williams, a barrister from Trinidad and Tobacco, from the Caribbeans. Du Bois used pan Negroism throughout his research in his PhD. And we may not forget, Du Bois was not the first African or first black to have prepared a PhD in African emancipation. But there again, a gold coaster by name Jacobus Eliza Johannes, 1742. If you could look at this thing, I stumbled over this research material in Holland when I was doing my postgraduate work. Interesting. We're so it's a gold coaster who wrote a PhD. First, 1742, 153 years so before is, is, after the voice. Academics writing will help to solve this Precisely, we are although, not you, writing. although you refuse to comment on the 21st September, same as I should leave that to the politicians. Well, politicians don't know why they put it. So we, we have three days. We're on the point of view. My guest is Professor A.B. Martinson. We are trying to uh, just lay a foundation. We started by talking about the Francophones and his work in Sorbonne and, and Senegal. And interestingly, he disagrees with um, July 1 being removed as Republic Day, but agrees with August 4 as Founders Day, but won't comment on September 21. Good. And if you, <laughs> give, me, yeah, if you give me some few minutes, no. let me chip in something about his, his Excellency President Kufour, his own contribution to Ghana. No, I'll come, to the, I'll come there. I want to take a short break. <laughs> this, is the, this is the point of view. Stay with us. Later on, we'll be talking about a book on Buzia, written by Anani <laughs> J, and Kufour wept. That's the, the epitaph, because during the launch, it was very moving. The tribute Kufour paid to uh, K.A. Buzia. All this and more on The Point of View. Stay with us.
spice up your mornings with culturally enriched conversations, social interviews, and policy-oriented discussions that will keep you updated on the progress of the nation. Let your voice be heard with the hashtag Breakfast Daily. It's actually a good thing and healthy to be okay in your own skin. Mm. Not because you don't have the options, but it's also healthy to be able to say, listen, I'm going to the movies by myself. I'm going to the restaurant by myself. Join us for breakfast daily, only on City TV. Join the Breakfast Daily team Monday through Fridays from 7.30 a.m. to 10. Welcome back. This is The Point of View. It's a Founders Day special. We hope you're enjoying the holiday. Uh, we're giving you something to think about. I'm interviewing the author of 20 books, including uh, the book I have currently. It's a very long title. The Return of the Descendants of Diasporan Africans to Continental Africa, including Ghana. You wrote this book this year. And 2019 is the year of return. Is that the reason why you wrote this book? The president said in Ghana and then later in the U.S. that this is a very significant year and that people should come back. Apparently, 400 years ago in 1619, this was the first time that the official slaves landed in Virginia. So 2019 is the year of the return. Is that why you, you wrote this book? Not at all. Incidentally, three years back, myself and other you know, academic colleagues, locally and outside, we had the idea, or we conceived the idea, of launching an international colloquy of 400 years. Okay. So luckily enough, when our president, you know, came down with this, we said, oh, hallelujah. Then let's get down and then assist our president. Mm. And so this is why I... So read. 1619 was a significant date because of what? Good. 1619, not necessarily 1619, 20th August, 1619. 20th August. 20th August. As I stipulated somewhere, let me jump before answering yeah. your I have stipulated that Every 20th, I guess, yearly, our president, since he has brought us this type of, you know, agenda, should carry it through to the United Nations. They are the spirit of my book. Mm. That 20th, I guess, should be deemed as a day of atonement. A day of atonement. A day of atonement for, you know, we in Africa, when I say we, I mean in the chiefs and people who were involved some of the chiefs and some of the people who were in leadership, who condoned and connived with, you know, the Westerners, especially the Portuguese. It, it may interest you, how did this slavery start? The Catholic Church was fully embedded, embedded in transatlantic slavery. Pope Ingenius IV, Pope Martin the First, the Fourth, and Bartholomew de la Casa and his Papa Bruce between 1400-1455 advised Christopher Columbus that police slavery is good. Really? Yes. My reference, this is an academic material, so I should give my reference. My reference the New African Magazine 2000, serial number 384, page 14, column 1. I've documented it here. So, I take it again. Just, yeah, so the New African Magazine, the year 2000. 2000, and also... Page what? Page 14, column 1, and also... Written by whom? Who wrote the article? It is one Eric Martins. Eric Martins. Good. He said the Catholic Church condoned. Good. Then slavery. also, yeah, get back to Tony Martin's book. This is a book. Tony Martin's From mm. Slavery to Marcus Garvey and Beyond, Massachusetts, Harvard, 1983. Again, get to Emmanuel Guess, and the Emmanuel is spelled I, the Guess, G E I S S. 
the Pan African Movement, mm. 1974, landing page 121125. And there again, the same Emmanuel Guest told us that Dr. J.B. Dankwa was vividly involved in Pan Africanism as laid back as 10 October 1935 with Alex Blay and to for him but more. You've moved. I'm still on the slave trade. Let's let's forget about that for now. You're talking about slave trade, 1619, August 20, the Day of Atonement. Precisely. Because people left Jamestown in Accra to Jamestown in Virginia. Virginia. Great. So you're saying that if there's any day that we should mark in this August, apart from August 1st, August 20, 20th, I guess, should be in yeah. Universal Day of Atonement. How significant then is the, the year of return that has been declared by, by this, this president? The year of return, yes. It is even declared by no other person than Trump. We are ending in December. Trump is ending his in August next year. Don't forget. So it is no news. They always do it. it they don't do it, but they always organize the African History Month, Black, the History Month. Black History Month. But now, the because of the anniversary 400 years, I don't forget, it is also 100 years anniversary of Marcus Garvey bringing his Black Star Line, also to bring, in, bring back slaves. 100 but years anniversary. 100 right? years anniversary, 1919. But unfortunately, Marcus Garvey was dead, was imprisoned, and he finally passed away 23rd June 1940, with his lower limbs paralyzed. What is the opportunity offered Ghana in this. you said Ghana is seen as a mecca of Pan-Africanism. Precisely. The president has declared it's the year of return. We know there's quite a number of Africans in the diaspora from the Caribbean, from the UK, and from the US who would want to come here. How do you suppose Ghana can leverage that for whatever benefit, whether tourism purposes or even economic or education-wise? Good. The politicians should come to academics like my good academic colleague who has written this book, mm -hmm. the book on, you know, Professor Buzia, yeah. myself and others like Professor Achuaya and the rest, they should get to us. We will sit down with them and give their consultancy. To answer your question directly, first and foremost, I use the word Afro-Mondialism. Mm -hmm. What is Afro-Mondialism? In my imagination, Pan-Africanism, since Henry Sylvester Williams, coin it. From 1900 to 2019, there had been a symbiosis. First, Pan-Africanism as idealism or utopianism, from there to movements, movements to continentalism, that is the birth of the OEU, continentalism to Afrocentrism of an academic colleague, Molefi Kete Asante of Harvard. He is looking at you know, African civilization, just like we learned from, you know, Sheikh Anta Job of Senegal. But we are saying that no, with Obama being the first black to go to the White House, that idea black to black, black power has, you know, should not exist. Because when you do that, the white, the so-called white supremacists, the Ku Klux Klan, they will look at us to be practicing anti-racial racism, black Zionism. So we are saying the white Quakers, they assisted in the emancipation, the liberation of Africans. Right? Look at Jimmy Carter of late, the fourth American president, going around dressing guinea worms. Is he looking for money? Is he looking for No, because of his commitment to, you know, black optimism. So we should have a different approach. The approach here is, oh, le, let me, permit me. Obama was not voted by African Americans alone. He was voted by other whites. And what is Afro-Mondialism? Who is an Afro-Mondialist? An Afro-Mondialist is that person, be him an African, be him a white, be him a Latino, who is gingerly poised to see to it that continental Africa, the black man, the African, is totally liberated, political, economically, culturally, artistically, morally, and otherwise, from the so-called mm. 
So, so you're, you're from what is the dominant free world? That is the Western world, and they are oligarchies. No. What are the oligarchies? The IMF, the World Bank, and so on and so forth. So, Afro mondialism is more that is my working with the different forces who support black liberation. The maiden is Afro optimism, color blind. I see. In the pantheon of Pan Africanists, who is the greatest? The greatest person is that person who perceives the African not by virtue of his pigments but someone who is focused, who is intelligent. Who has done the most in that cause? Is it Padmore? Is it Du Bois? Is it Nkrumah? Is it Gavi? Is it uh, Williams? Good. They have all contributed their quota, just like how we're talking of people in UGCC. We cannot single them, but we should not negate. We should not, you know, more or less sandwich the contribution of that person. Who first coined that word? And that is Henry Sylvester Williams. How many of our, our children, our students, have ever heard of the name Henry Sylvester Williams? Just because he's a Caribbean. From Trinidad and Tobago, he's not from African America. He's not an African American. But Du Bois, why is Du Bois you know, so up? Henry Sylvester Williams died prematurely. That is 1911 of, you know, sickle cell disease. And Du Bois was invited into the first Pan African Congress. At Versailles. So Du Bois continued 1919, 1921, 1923, 27 because of the global recession 29. No Pan Africanism. But then 1945, Du Bois, you know, had Pan African meeting in Manchester. Their baby Pan Africanism was carried across the Bay of Biscay to the Kole Lagoon here in Accra by Nkrumah. And so it's a, it's a baton. Everybody hands over. So you can, let me ask you our two final people. So Chief Alfred Sam, I, I did an interview recently where I was told that he actually successfully brought some Africans back home. He was a businessman from Ghana, from the Akim Odan area, or Akim Ebuakwa, lived in the U.S., brought, Oklahoma. brought free slaves back, back to Africa. There isn't much written about him in any of the literature, but you do write a bit about him in your book. Yeah. Where, where did you get information from him? Who, is, who was he, quickly? Good. Here, Chief, the full name, Chief Alfred Charles Kofi Sam, was someone sent by his parents, not at a slave. He arrived in the U.S., Oklahoma, and he conceived the idea of bringing back, you know, some of the free slaves who wanted to come down to Africa. So he licensed a boat, and... 13th January, 1915, he successfully landed at Salt Point with 400 of the freedmen. Mm. But unfortunately, the chiefs there, he wanted to send them to his own backyard. That is Akima Boko. The chiefs would not give him land. Mm. So only 35 of them successfully, you know, stayed back. He grew annoyed, took them back to that wow. area. So he wasn't successful. He was not successful. You dedicate a chapter finally to President Theodore Obian Ngweman Basogo. He's been in power for 40 years. How can this... He says he's a hero for Pan-Africanism. He's a very wealthy man. Some of his citizens are still very poor. How is this person a hero of Pan-Africanism? That's very good. It's a very good question. Here, those who dance to the political logo of the West, whether they're in power for 20, 30 years, it is not in the interest of the West neither to come down to African media and academia. Take the case of, what is it called? A place like Cameroon. Paul Bia, for how long has he been there? Name them. I'll name them one by one. But in any case, to answer this question, Pan-African economics. The late Mugabe, in fact, a matter of Mugabe, Libya, Muhammad al-Gaddafi, the Desert Hawk, 2012, I wrote the book. I've got a copy around. Here, Mugabe was, you know, more or less, you know, sidelined by the so-called five colonies of, you know, African world is going of state. This is someone who carried, you know, the politics of Nkrumah and the rest of them of the African Union. Put it there, put his money. By now, if you had wanted to use, we are using cell phones right now. Before you call what is it called someone, it will pass through London and Mugabe did. I mean, this guy did video everything. That's Mohammed Al Gaddafi. So when he died, Ngwema, 
put his Pan African feet in the Pan African boots. So he puts his money oh, where his wait. mouth is. So that look at so, what is it called? So he is paid it, a lot for the a lot for a fifteen Afcon at Morocco. You know. Yeah. Blocked us. So for, because of he his, took everything. his financial support. So many other things. Someone can support Africa one way or the other. Brilliant. There's a lot more in this book. Get a copy. It's a really fascinating read. It has a very enriching timeline from 1619 all the way to present time. And it's written by Professor Adrian Martinson. Prof, great to have you on the show. Thank you. Have a happy Founders Day. It's my pleasure. We'll talk again soon. It's my pleasure. And you can, get so my... you can get copies of this book at City TV's front desk if you want a copy. We'll be right back to talk about Buzia. Stay with us. friendly, affordable, and quality fertilizers. Committed to improving crop production and ensuring food security through improved yields in Ghana. This is Glofet Limited, a wholly owned Ghanaian company with a global outlook. Ghana's leading name in fertilizer production, Glofet has built a state-of-the-art 120 metric tons per hour fertilizer blending factory, the largest in Ghana. This is able to blend all types of MPK to the specific requirements of farmers. With a 45,000 metric ton warehouse, trust Glofet Limited for all types of MPKs, urea, sulfate of ammonia, potassium nitrate, calcium nitrate, boron, and many more. Glofet is currently participating in the Planting for Food and Jobs initiative under the Ministry of Food and Agriculture. Call us on 0544-339-513 or 0243-512-171. Locate our head office at number 2 Ni Amon Lane, East Legon, Accra. Email sales at glofet.com. Glofet, growing growth. For regular news checks as they unfold, 2020 News, all day, all the time. Politics, sports, entertainment, business and more. 2020 News, we bring you the world in 20 minutes. Welcome back. So today is a special uh, Founders Day edition, and we want to give you food for thought. There's a great book you should have, K. Buzia, A Symbol of Democracy, uh, a book written by Anna Neje, who's my guest, an expert in strategic communication, an author, and a strong champion of African excellence. And he's written a book about Ghana's Brown Afro region, the story of African society in the heart of the world, and books that promote tourism. This is his latest work. He also has um, books on Dr. Buzia, Axioms of K. Buzia, and selected species of K. Buzia. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Why are you so interested in Buzia? Um, I'm interested in Buzia in the first place because the man symbolizes many of the virtues required for nation building. Mm. If you study Buzia carefully, you realize that he was a product of a society that thinks about the future, but not only about the present. And because of that, many people during his time didn't understand many of the things he did. Mm -hmm. And so through my research, I came to understand this man so well that I decided not to keep to myself what I had learned about him. And that I should share with the rest of the world, especially the youth, so that we could replicate Buzia, more of Buzia in our society, mm -hmm. so that the aspirations of our founding fathers will be realized going mm -hmm. forward. I noticed you've written some books on the Brong Ahafo region. Yes. And of course, the name has been changed to <laughs> Bono and then Ahafo and then and, and that, that type of thing. Is it that you are from... And of course, Busia is from Wenchi, is he not? He is. So what, what's the, the connection? Is it, are you related to him? Is he it, is it a, is it a family member? Or are you a, a, a historian retelling the, the Bono story? For which you are interested in Buzia. You didn't mention the other books I've also written on Ghana in general. Oh, you have? Yes, the yes. story of Africa. I know, I'm just saying, but yes. I just see the, co yeah. the connection. Actually, Professor Buzia is or was not my relative. No relation? No, I come from Nisuatre, and he comes from Wenchi. That's uh, not too far. Yes, but you see, I was introduced to Buziaism by my father, my late father. Buziaism? Yes. 
And mm. my father was so passionate about Buzia that he wanted me to learn hard to become a doctor like Professor Buzia. Okay. And there's an interesting issue. I even mentioned it during the luncheon. Mm -hmm. The very day I had admission to pursue my PhD course was the day my father passed on. Wow. You know, he told me about the great exploits. I was a great scholar. And despite his high stature, he was humble and he related with everybody and all that. And then whilst in school, I'm sure you also share this one with me. Mm. There are so many myths about Buzia. Yes. Teachers from the kindergarten to the university will tell me so many things about Buzia. And I decided to research and get to know more about these issues about Buzia. And through that, I came into contact with so many people, including President Jay Kofo, who served as Buzia's foreign, uh, deputy minister. foreign minister. At the age of 29. Yes. So I came in contact with so many people. And then the very family of Buzia, including his last surviving sister, Madame Mama Buzia, wow. who adopted me as her son. Wow. And so more or less, I became part of the Buzia family. And not only here in Ghana, even back in Oxford, Holland, and all these places that Buzia worked and or learned. For example, Oxford University gave me some materials about Buzia that will blow your mind. Wow. From the very day he stepped there, so the last day, you everything got, you about photos Buzia, and everything. Everything they gave to me, and Buzia is so much. And all cherished. of that is in the book. Everything is captured here, including that those very pictures we have. So there's some, some nice photos yes. here of Buzia, a, a class of yes. all white people, and this is uh, 19. I'm sure it's in the 40s, 45 to yes. 46. Do you answer the question of why his government was so short, 27 months in office? Does the book attempt to answer? why his political career as prime minister was so short? Yes, it does. In fact, the book, um, much of the information centers on his political side, his 27-month premiership and all that, and his days during the First Republic as leader of the opposition and as leader of the opposition in exile and all that. You see, uh, during the First and Second Republics, or even all the way to the Third, we didn't understand much about what we are practicing today that we call democracy. And Buzia was somebody who was looking far beyond his time. Many of the people around didn't understand him. And so these soldiers who came to overthrow his government, in the same way they didn't understand him, they were impatient and interestingly, after he had been ousted, many of the things he had initiated which they wanted to kick out, he could not run away from them. Many years after Buzia's death, time has vindicated him. And even as a nation in general, we are getting back into the ideas and ideals of Buzia. Give me an example. For example, at the time that one party state has become so fashionable here in Africa and in our very country, Buzia said, Tikron Kwejina. What does it mean? One head does not constitute a council. So he was talking about multi party democracy. Today, can you mention one party state? here in Ghana, the very constitution that is being used for governance today has more or less made one party state a taboo. So it tells you that we have gone back to what Buzia said. At the time that Buz, uh, there, there, were, there were vast stretches of forest, we had very different varieties of timber and all that, Buzia said we should plant trees. And he put special emphasis on thick trees. At the time, I'm sure people were laughing at him. Uh, we have forests. We have uh, the Odum, Wawa, Sapele, and all that. We are asking us to plant trees to get more timber and all that. Buzia was looking beyond 2019, from 1969. Because he said that it will be, become very expensive at a point in time to carry power from Bakosumbo and other places through cement and iron rods by way of the poles. So let us plant these trees. The to thick, tree, thick trees. Which then became what we now use as electric exactly. pole, the wooden one. And even beyond that, it has gone beyond that. Mm. We are using a uh, thick tree for everything. True furniture and whatever, whatever wood is used for. So that's one of the, the things. We are, we are told Buzia was one of the champions of rural development. It was really one of the things that we read about in studying political sure. science. What was his idea for rural development and how was it misunderstood? Buzia thought that every Ghanaian could contribute positively to nation building, mm -hmm. irrespective of where they were living. Mm -hmm. And so whether the person was living in a village or in a city, 
there must be a good environment for them to operate well. Mm -hmm. So let us send electricity to them in the villages. Let us make their roads well. Mm -hmm. Let us give them hospital or health center or whatever. From the colonial days, the development had been skewed in favor of the urban centers. So Buzia was talking of rural industrialization. Interestingly, that is being revisited today by way of one district, one factory, one village, one dam, and all that. So Buzia, in fact, was the first leader of our country who established um, a ministry in, in charge of rural development. And so President Gofor will tell you that, go to every corner of Ghana, when you see a hospital, ask, when was it built? That road, feeder road over there, ask them, when was it built? And they will trace it to Buzia's time. There are many health, uh, district health centers in Ghana which were built during Buzia's time. At the time, he was just building it all over the place. They were springing out, whether it was health center or to pipe bomb water. In fact, his schools, they were called mushroom schools. Because, because every now and then, schools were just springing up. And so many of these um, health posts have now become district health um, centers across mm. the country. So Buzia thought that let us give the people decent accommodation. Let us help their roads, whatever, so that they can also contribute from wherever they are to national development. There, there, are, there are some who talk about his relationship with Nkrumah and, and feel he was a position leader that some people even say he opposed the motion for independence, the so-called motion of destiny. Do you address that in this book? Yes. That what was his view about independence at the time that we went for independence? You see... Um, it, it is exactly 50 years since Buzia came into power this month. So we are celebrating the golden jubilee of Buzia's assumption of power. 69 to 2019. Yes, exactly 50 years. It was this very same month in August 1969 that Buzia was elected. His government was elected to form this government. And there are many issues about his governance and his government that um, the propagandists have tried to um, put shadows on. But this book has thrown light on many of these things. In fact, on 6 March 1957, Buzia and his people did not boycott parliament. And Buzia indeed contributed to the motion for independence, which was moved by Kwame Nkrumah. And I can tell you that that very speech or statement he gave in parliament, after the proceedings, the leader of the American group, then Richard Nixon, who represented the American delegation, he later became American president. He held a press conference and stressed that Buzia's speech, in fact, he described it as the most brilliant speech, and recommended that it should be read across the globe because it was so great a statement that um, <laughs> he thought it was something that should not be limited only to Ghana. So that must tell you that Buzia and his people were right there in parliament. And in fact, I've even put a picture in there somewhere of Buzia and Kwame Nkrumah. In fact, Buzia was not somebody who hated Kwame Nkrumah. But he hated some of the policies of Nkrumah. I've just given you one. Mm -hmm. He thought that one party state, for instance, was a step backward <laughs> into the, mm. the, as far as our, our um, traditional system was concerned. Mm. Let people, allow people to share ideas, whether they oppose or they agree with you. Mm. Because even in the palace, the Omanhine will not say, well, I am the leader, so I have said this. Mm. All the reps over there, everybody will express their views, yeah. and then eventually yeah. a consensus is built. So that was Buzia. That was the difference between Buzia and Kwame Nkrumah. Good. So this book was launched last week. Last week, Wednesday. We have, we'll be showing you some, some photos of the launch. President Kufour was there. We'll put some of the photos on the screen for you to watch. Very interesting. We understand Kufour wept. Why, why did he weep? Um, I think that President Kufour is a very grateful person. According to him, it was Buzia who held his hand and put him in Oxford. And he nurtured him in politics. So he thinks that Kufu, it was Buzia who has made him what he has become. Mm. And so 50 years back, such a great person mm. talking about Buzia and tears welling up his and eyes. And the, the, has there been any work on Buzia of this kind yet? The, any work of this magnitude? Yeah, I think the chairman of, the board chairman of the BED, Buzia Institute for Rural and Democratic Development, said that this is the most comprehensive document yet on Professor Buzia. Amazing. No, it's, it's, it's interesting because you even address the very controversial devaluation which triggered this overthrow and even the aliens compliance order, yes. which interestingly we are having issues with foreign nationals again. Yes. Uh, that, that's very interesting. And even for that, not many people know that the aliens compliance order 
for which Buzia has been lashed out all the time, was initiated by Kwame Nkrumah in 1963, and it was amended in 1965. And even the military government that came before Buzia thought that it was a good policy. They were about to pursue it. And when Buzia came, he said, look, this is a good plan. Every foreigner in Ghana, let us know that you are from this country or that country. Let us know what you are doing. And through that, we were able to get people paying taxes, which earlier, before then, was not happening. And mm. tell me, Bernard, mm. do we have any country in the world today that's, that does not use alias compliance order? No, not a single So 50 thing. years afterwards, he's been vindicated, vindicated, you think? What about the devaluation? That's what led to his overthrow. Devaluation, the main purpose was to encourage export and discourage import. So as to strengthen the, 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 import the country. Import substitution. Yes, the country's economy. People didn't understand They that. didn't understand. One of the major problems of Buzia was that he was far ahead of his time. So many of his contemporaries didn't understand. But so too was in Kroma. Is it that he couldn't communicate his views? Um, Maybe he, was, he wasn't an effective communicator of his ideas? Well, if you're a leader, you are not supposed to communicate it to yourself. You must have people... Who communicate it. with you. Yes, probably. So that could have been one of his failures. Maybe. Because Where can we get this book to buy? Oh, the... Uh, how do you call it? The Kingdom Books, EPP Books Shop, and then the Methodist Bookshop. And we want to leave copies here too. At City as well. Yes. Wow. So it's a yeah. double bumper. And there is also a, a telephone line that you call wherever you are in Ghana, it will be given to you. If okay. I can quote it. I'll put the number on the screen. Mention sure. it. Mention the number. 0243 mm. It's a really good book you should get. And it's good for two reasons. You read it, it's easy to read, and it's also a good reference material. And I recommend all journalists to get a copy. So you can come to City TV or City FM and pick a copy as you can for the first book we discussed. Anani, thank you. Congratulations on this great work. Thank I'm you. sure Buzia will be proud of you. Well, we, we have to leave it here. It's, it's been a holiday, an intellectual holiday edition of the show, uh, talking about diaspora issues, the year of return, Pan-Africanism, and Kofi Abrefa Buzia. We hope you've learned something from the show. My name is Ben Alavle. Thank you very much for watching today's edition of The Point of View. Stay with us. See you next time.